Hi there, I'm Adam Paltrowitz of Coral Clarity. And I'm Charlie Kinnison of Kinnison Coral Company. And uh, we really wanted to have a conversation about coral rehearsal tracks and about Kinnison Coral Company and um, all about how uh, coral rehearsal tracks are going to be helpful moving forward, how they could benefit choirs of all levels, and also about our partnership and what, what we hope to accomplish together. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it just, I think a lot of people might not know this, but choral rehearsal tracks is what we call them today. They actually go, they have sort of a long history, like back to like, you know, cassette tapes and like recording them on your stereo, like on top of your piano, like in the 1990s, you know, it's, it's the yeah. same thing. It's just the technology has changed. I actually remember doing a, a festival concert um, at Long Island University and this was 1998 or 99, and they were still selling part tapes. They were, you know, cassette tapes, and they were just the parts being plunked out on a horrible synthesizer. But they went all the way back then. And at that point, I have to tell you, I was kind of against him. I mean, I really thought, you know, why should people be learning these, you know, off of these awful um, synthesized parts? Because there's no musicality there. And... They're really not learning anything, but the world has changed so much, um, not just in the, the core rehearsal world, but also um, with the sight reading tools that have come out that we can, we can really dive into sight seeing so much in the classroom that we now have the benefit of really, really good tools to maximize sight reading in minimal amounts of time as well as these amazing choral rehearsal tracks that can help students to learn music. Oh, yeah, totally. And, and, you know, and it's funny you say that you were against it because ironically, when I was a singer in high school and college myself, I was sort of against them too, because even back then I was so, I was such an advocate for music literacy and I always loved sight reading like ever since middle school. I have a big strong piano background and my parents taught me how to sight read at such an early age. So I was just like, everyone should learn how to do this. Everyone should learn, never learn by rote, never learn by rote. But as I've gotten older and wiser, I think there are, there are benefits to both of them. And it's not necessarily right. apples and oranges, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's the most amazing thing. And, and, you know, Charlie and I have been doing this, talking about this for a few months now. And I love the fact that you are such an advocate for literacy first that this is not hey everybody buy choral rehearsal tracks because they're going to make your choir better it's more like it's it's part of the big picture and if you're not going if you're not going to be teaching sight reading then we shouldn't be talking about choral rehearsal tracks oh totally totally yeah you know there's so many puzzle pieces to give a good meaningful memorable performance and part of part of that puzzle is music literacy and the other part is like strong rehearsals over and over and over until you don't know how else to do it but close right. to perfect you know yeah like repetition and i also wanted to share because i i've seen a lot of people posting about this lately as well that i think you know teaching by rote is also a very, very important part of the choral experience and there's authenticity and the lots lots of music that would be more beneficial to be taught by rote and again that also means not using choral rehearsal tracks it means call and response you're the teacher up there, you're singing, and, and the group should be responding in that visceral way. And so, so this whole picture of sight reading, the whole picture of core rehearsal part, uh, tapes, and um, teaching by rote, they're all together what will make a fine choral program, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I think you should learn how to utilize each style of learning because that's that's the big picture like you said you know sight reading then using choral rehearsal tracks to rehearse at home after the director has like walked through the piece and i i had my students write in their solfege all the time i'm sure there are other teachers out there who do the same thing and then sure. yeah teaching some music by rote because that's oral training yeah Completely. So then that brings me to how did you get into this choral rehearsal track industry? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's a great and a fun question because 
it stems back to sort of my college days when I joined the four-time International Barbershop Chorus Champion, uh, the Ambassadors of Harmony here in St. Louis, Missouri. They're in St. Charles, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they were a barbershop course. This is still our barbershop course. I still sing with them. But a lot of the men in our hundred plus men choir, they aren't musicians and they don't know how to read music. So right. they would use what they call learning tracks in the barbershop world. Mm -hmm. And I have a really good friend of mine. He's like the guy to go to for learning tracks and Tim Warwick. He, uh, he even came to my wedding. He was invited to our wedding. He's wow. a really great friend of mine. He's been doing this forever just through basically barbershop music. So he was making learning tracks. So when I joined uh, AOH, Ambassadors of Harmony, every one of our songs, we probably had over a hundred songs in our library online. All of them had what they called learning tracks. And I was like, what is this? Like, can't I just bring the music to rehearsal and like sight read it and like not use the learning track? And, and, right. um, and, 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 but people still use the learning tracks. I learned to actually have fun with them. Like yeah. I would still, I would play like my, I sing lead and I would play my lead mute track and then sing uh. my part. I can sight read just fine, but it was fun to rehearse with such a good singer, like at the same time, you know? So, so, so that's sort of like how I got introduced to even just, in, in this industry at all. And then I was a high school choir director for about four years. And during my third year of teaching, um, I gave my advanced ladies chamber ensemble a really tough arrangement of my own of, uh, I think it was like Beauty and the Beast or something like that. And it was difficult, but I had actually made tracks myself like years back just for fun in college. And I had a friend who was an audio engineer sort of make them into like part specific tracks and part left tracks. And I gave them to my students after I had taught the piece. And it was, it was, again, it was a very difficult piece, but they came back a couple of rehearsals later and they nailed all the notes. And mm. I was like, this is awesome. Like I, I had taught them previously, but now we could work on like emotional elements and like moving the music and phrasing. And it right. was probably one of our best songs that we had ever done that year because they were able to go home, rehearse with like the sounds of a real choir at home, not just during mm -hmm. our 55 minutes each day during class time. It was like they right. had extra time to do it at home and they nailed it. So, hmm. so just having that experience, it just it sort of got my gears turning a little bit. And then my wife and I left teaching to sort of venture out into the choral music entrepreneurship. And it sort of just blossomed from there. We wanted to stay within the choral music education sort of world and, and, mm. and stay close to close to the same friends and the same people. And we're like, what are our skills that we have? We, we can sing decently and we have like semi good equipment at the time. I was like, let's just try it. And actually our very first rehearsal track that we made was for our, our mutual friend, Maria Ellis. Oh, wow. <laughs> she was also in our wedding. She was one of the bridesmaids in Carrie and I's wedding. And um, she, it was only for like, the tenor part for some St. Louis children's choir song or whatever. She's like, Hey, can you make a piano track to this? And I was like, I just thought like piano. Why don't I just sing it? <laughs> so I, right. did it like, Oh, that was so good. The kids that's loved it. Like, can you do more? And I just kept going and that's sort of where it started. Fascinating how it started. Yeah. Oh, totally. Right. Yeah. So no, that's amazing. So, so here you are and you've been doing it nonstop for, for a long time. And so what makes your choral tracks, um, in your mind, the best on the market? Because I have to say that the way I discovered, um, you know, how we've built a relationship over the last, you know, six months or so was I, I found your website and I checked it out and I heard the demo on the first page and I was like, wow, this sounds different from what I've been purchasing elsewhere and so there is clear intent to what you were trying to do it's not you didn't just stumble upon a difference in what you're doing so what what was your mindset behind creating something different yeah well i i, I consider myself lucky because like i said the way that i even got introduced to this sort of industry as a whole was through tim warwick and what he calls his tim tracks through the barbershop harmony society and he is just one of the best singers I know. He's so musical. His tracks are fantastic, um, but they sound mm -hmm. like a barbershop quartet because that's sort of what he does. Right. But he, he, he sings his learning tracks with such musicality. Mm -hmm. And he actually had the same 
uh, choir director in college that I had in Dr. Jim Henry, who's one of the oh. best directors ever. So that was sort of my default. Like I was like, oh, they have to be like this. But I didn't realize at the time that he's one of the best in the world at this. Mm -hmm. so I just thought like, oh, he's good, but maybe that's just the default. So when I made them, I was like, I have to be musical. I have to be emotional. I have to make it almost as perfect as possible. And then also, this is kind of cheesy, but I grew up listening to a lot of Take Six, like my parents mm -hmm. listened to Take Six all the time. And so just the sound of listening to the car just surrounded you and the bass singer Alvin Chia surrounded you and Claude McKnight, it was just pingy and full force and everything. So I wanted our tracks to sort of surround you just like you would when you're standing on the risers in a choir right. or like an orchestra hall or something. So it just, it made sense to me to create them that way. Um, and we, we spend so much time working on details and nuance because I, I truly believe that the smallest details, they make the largest of impacts. And mm. when they're not there, you kind of don't notice, but when they are there, you notice them. If that makes so sense. How, how long does it take you to make an average uh, rehearsal track? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if we're just talking like SATB with accompaniment, yeah. like, I don't know, maybe eight pages or something. Yeah. It might take, uh, it might take like an hour to record the accompaniment. Um, and then uh, I usually lay down the bass track first, which mm -hmm. usually takes maybe 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And then I'll do the tenor, which is basically the same thing. And then I'll sort of uh, clean up. If I have like S's off, I'll just go back and redo that or T's aren't together or entrances, mm -hmm. I'll re redo those. And then I just schedule my wife, Carrie, to record and she records herself. I'm not even there. She, I mean, she is a beast at this. And yeah. she comes in and nails it. And uh, then I listen through and, uh, and we do some mixing and mastering and then I'm done. So total, I mean, maybe takes five to six hours on a four part piece with accompaniment. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And the thing, the thing that you described that, that's so true is that your recordings, they sound, the demos themselves sound like a recording. It sounds like a choir. It doesn't sound like you and your wife, um, you know, making, you know, hey, I got the bass and tenor and you got the soprano and alto. Right. It sounds like a real choir. So it doesn't just sound like, oh, this is a piece I might want to buy. It actually, it pretty much sounds like it's a real, really well rehearsed choir singing yeah. it. Yeah, for every piece that we get, we score study pretty heavily as if I were directing it for like an honor choir. You know, I, I mark up the scores, I write breaths, I, I you know, diff longs and glides and everything. I mean, my scores look like a rainbow threw up on them when I'm done with them, like for every single one of them, you know. And, and, and it, when we first started this out, I always told Carrie and we sort of uh, agreed to each other. It's like every track that we do, we want to be able to like, put it on an album someday we probably won't but like that's uh -huh. the level of quality that we wanted for each one like we could just grab six or seven and be like here's our Kenneth and Coral Company album and we wouldn't have to do anything to them that's that's really cool and, and and I really feel that way especially since you've done you know six of my pieces so far yeah. I really yeah. feel like when I'm listening to it I feel like I'm listening to a great choir singing so it, it's sure, sure. it's oh, it's really a cool a cool thing to listen to and and as a composer you know you're coming back to me for feedback too mm -hmm. which is really you know a valuable thing you know if there's anything stylistically that I think might be missing and we, and then very rarely do I have any comments because I I personally like people to to interpret my piece. Right. Um, I also wanted to address because we talked about barbershop. I feel like the acapella world has been so far ahead of the choral world, and that when I when I buy an arrangement from Rob Dietz or um, Ben Bram or Nikki Brenner, who is you know my colleague, but she's out there doing amazing work. Mm -hmm. The the demos themselves are awesome yep. and they're really really high quality um and i have not seen that in the choral world until i've come across your stuff not to not to say that what's out there is not solid in terms of the parts and the rhythms being right and it being well sung but i haven't heard when i buy rob Dietz's arrangement for my group that he wrote for me yeah. or one that he has stock it sounds really, really good. And when my students are listening, they really have a sense of the line and the shape. Right, and I right. hadn't seen that before. Yeah, um, they're, they're, the almost like, they're almost like radio ready. 
You yes. Know? Yeah, it's like, you know, remember the movie, I mean, you've probably watched this, but Pitch Perfect, the first yeah. one, you know? Sure. Like, Geek Sharon did all of those arrangements and all of those songs that they had in there, they were all studio quality, recorded in a, in a professional studio, like acapella pieces. And I just thought, like, why can't choral music sound like that, too? Because it can, it's just not right now when it comes to this sort of industry. Yeah, especially since we're talking about virtual choirs now, which essentially are that. That's what they are. The virtual choirs now are demos. They really are independently sung lines that are, that are edited and cleaned up right. and balanced after the fact, which is essentially what you're doing. Yep. Um, you're really creating a virtual choir each and every time. Yeah. And which is, which is an amazing thing. And, and again, I think that virtual choirs are going to continue even post pandemic because there are certain things that you can do there that you can't do, um, you know, live. Totally. Totally. And one, one thing is working internationally, which I think is mm. so cool. And it's been such a silver lining over this past year. It's like, working with people in London, working with people in Australia that you can't do before and you can't do in a live concert. Right. You have a great blog post that I, I was telling you about before, but I love the blog post about why you should have a video, you know, why uh, reasons to have a virtual uh, choir to create one. And none of them had to do with the pandemic. These were all viable reasons for how people can benefit by being part of a virtual choir. And I loved it. I thought it was just such a positive spin on this, not just for this year, but for the future. And again, I feel like your recordings, they embody the best of that. Um, so um, so I, I'd like to discuss, you know, the, I, I've been using, you know, Matt Curtis and, and choral tracks and I have nothing but positive things to say about Matt and his company, and they're really responsive. Um, you know, so if you're go if anybody's listening to this and they do, I, I I use Matt Curtis, and I and I really like his work. I like his work too. And my high school choir uses um, his choral tracks on a lot of the tracks that we do. So my question is, what makes yours different? Because I, I'm personally, when I listen to yours, I'm enjoying them more, and I think that they're they're more effective um, in many ways. So I, I I'd like to know what you think about your product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, Matthew Curtis is fantastic because he sort of started this like choral music industry when it comes to these rehearsal tracks I and mean, he was the pioneer you know without him carrie and i probably wouldn't have even started this or even thought about it yeah so it's awesome that he was innovative in such a way that that it sort of made this industry blossom and, and made people aware of the tools that are out there you know so mm -hmm. and and, and, for, and for, you know i think even that stemmed from Again, my good friend Tim Warwick, you know, who who did the right. work too. So, oh, and my my daughter jumped on the call too. So, say say hi to everybody, Nora. And and my son, he's not jumping on. He's just crying upstairs. Yeah. So that's that's uh, I don't know if he's crying. He's doing something upstairs. Not sleeping. Not sleeping is what he's yeah. doing. So this is I, the real I, world. I got distracted. You asked a question, but I totally forgot what it was. Yeah, I'm asking you about, about your product. What makes it different? What makes it unique? Because I can tell you right off the bat, if, I, if you play for me a track of yours and a track of Matt's, mm -hmm. I will instantly know the difference without in a heartbeat and and i have a blog post that's out right now where it compares the two just you know just so you can hear it um so you can tell that one is different from the other so what makes yours unique the audio and and also in terms of you know the packaging yeah 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 i i think one thing is um is we we're a husband and wife team you know carrie is naturally a soprano i'm naturally a tenor um, and, and we've had a lot of great feedback from our current clients of like, oh, it's so nice for my eighth grade girls to hear a, a girl sing the parts, you know, and like, not me, which I actually did when I started out. And yeah. like, uh, uh, I, that's when I was like, Carrie, can you just do the, do the girl parts for me? And she's like, oh, yeah, sure. And then she like came in and nailed a high B flat or something like that. So, uh, yeah. So I think just, just the fact that we're husband and wife, a male and female singers, and then the fact that we are so particular about 
the quality of, of the musicianship and the dynamics and the turns of phrases, the turns of cards, everything that's in there in just the, just the rehearsal track, you know? It's just, we, we wanna be as musical as possible and stylistically as possible too. Like we always tell people, we're not gonna sing a, like a palestrina the same way we're going to sing a Moses Hogan. Like it's just, mm -hmm. they, they shouldn't be sung the same. They shouldn't have the same sort of post-production effects like mm -hmm. you know, in like a cathedral or like in a tight little concert hall. Um, so I, I think that's another thing too, is that we pride ourselves on the stylistic part of our rehearsal tracks. And then the way that we package our tracks, they're always the same. They come with the full mix, which is just like, you know, radio ready or, or studio quality, like balanced voices. Then we have just the accompaniment if there is a compliment and then we have part specific ones and then we have part specific left tracks where like you know the soprano part plays in your left and then everything else is in your right and then the part specific mute tracks where like you're missing whatever track that is and then everything else you just sort of sing along with i love that because you have all different levels of singers in there so when you're dealing with a singer that that really really struggles this is you know i believe in self-select choirs so you have all different levels in the same group so for me the weakest singers need just the part or the part with the accompaniment they need to hear it over and over and over and over again as, and practice that way but then you get to a student that that that's a little bit more advanced, maybe an average singer in the group, and they need to hear the part in relationship to the other parts because that's really an ideal way to hear it. But then once you get to an, being an advanced singer or an average singer who's really nailed nailed it, they really get it. Now you want to hear that the the other parts and not your own part and fit your part in. How well can you sing your part against all the other parts? And you know, when I was growing up, the way they do it is they'd embarrass you. The choir directors would embarrass you. They'd make you stand up in front of the <laughs> choir in a quartet and say, I, I still did that when I was teaching. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know, if you've got a select group, that's fine. Great. Go for it. But in my self-selected program, I do have, let's say, I have a, a third of the students that could do it, no problem. I have the average students that, that could do it when they get to a certain level. And then I have a third of the students that are contributing vocally. They can be contributing vocally, but they also could embarrass themselves and totally lose their part if they're the only one. But here they have the tools to practice that skill and sing their part against it because it's really important that they hear the whole the whole track without their part it's important yes. they're developing their ear that way and what's important i like the way you sort of uh, explained it how you have like a third here a third here because i think that's sort of the average of high school choral programs you know yeah. i think that's pretty normal so you know if, if you're listening to this and like you can relate to what adam said i mean tr try and take what we're saying to heart because because we, we I, me i've personally been there as a as a high school choir director and it was the same thing adam it's like i had those right. those handful of students that like i right. could just go say go into a practice room and they would come out like learning it perfectly right and those middle ground students and then the the kids who like are just taking it as a class but like they enjoy me as a teacher you know right you know, yeah yeah I you know I and, and then I, I don't know about you but I have students that say stuff like you know I know the part when I'm singing it with everybody else <laughs> but I don't know it. and you know of course our instinct as a teacher is to say well then you don't really know the part but it's not completely true. Uh -huh. They do kind of know the part. They're not only just mimicking, they know it. But the problem is they don't know how to get from A to B. And A to B is I could sing it when other people are singing it. But what happens when nobody else is singing that part? Now I'm going to gravitate to something else that I know, that I've heard, yeah. and join that part. And so this, when you get to that muted part where the part is taken out, you're developing that skill. Right, exactly. And, and this is a great transition into what Carrie and I always say about our product and why we have it sound a particular way is we say safety in numbers which is why our product, we want our product to sound like a, a real choir when you're rehearsing at home. Because when you're rehearsing with uh, tracks that sometimes it sounds like one individual singer, like per track, you don't, you feel more naked that way. 
But when you're rehearsing mm -hmm. with our product and it sounds like you're rehearsing with a choir, there is that safety in numbers and there's more confidence building in that singer. Right. And, and you know, that is, that is a comparison that with Matt um, and Choral Tracks, the, the intent is to be like a section leader, like Matt and his team want the tracks to be like, hey, you're in a practice room with the section leader, mm -hmm. sing along with the section leader right. or with all the section leaders if they have a, a, a uh, muted part. Almost like um, a quartet or a quintet or something. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas yours is sing along with the entire section. Yeah. So it's a different, it's a different approach in terms of what you're getting um, there. Yeah, and I, and I think it boils down to philosophy. You know, our philosophy is like, we, we, we just, we love the sound of large choirs. We've always been sort of in, in, that, in that vibe of like, we love the large sound. We love the, the, the different colors of the voices coming together. And so that's sort of where our product sort of derives from too. Right. Yeah. You know, now in terms of um, our, our collaboration and discussing the stuff that we're trying to do, what, what, what I'm really grateful for is the fact that we're going to have making all of the demos and tra rehearsal track recordings um, on my site because now I feel like I've got this really, really amazing quality um, product to match my music. And frankly, you know, I have a vision of what I want my music to sound like but a picture's worth a thousand words. And the fact that I've got these wonderful demos on YouTube now and, and the, you know, right now we have six, but I know we're going to have them all probably by the summertime um, of all the pieces and the future ones. To me, I'm really grateful for it, but, you know, now people can really hear it and follow along with the sheet music and see what it should sound like. Sure, sure, um, sure. No, and, you yeah. Know, sorry, I hate to interrupt. I just, I just thought of this sort of metaphor. It's like if you're an author and you want like part of your book read by someone to like be sold, it's like, do you want Danny DeVito to do it or do you want Morgan <laughs> Freeman to do it? You know? Yeah. It's like, it's like you, you, you want the higher quality voiceover with. I mean, Danny exactly. DeVito is great. I love him. He's hilarious. But like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's how I feel about it. And I feel like now when people listen to my recordings, I don't have to say, well, picture what it would sound like with your group. Yeah. You can hear it sung beautifully. And, you know, I try and write accessible music. My intent is to write for self-selected choirs. Mm -hmm. And so if you like the sound of it, it's going to sound like that with your group. Um, it's going to work within your right. group. So I, I love... I love the fact that we have that. And on top of that, whatever people are hearing on with my music, they know they're going to get all of those parts individually sung with that kind of musicality for their singers, exactly. where they're going to have the individual part. They're going to have the part where it's in the left ear and, and everything else panned to the right, where one part is muted, and of course, the demo. So to me, um, I'm super excited about having um, your recordings. I get excited every time you send me a new one. So, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always anxious to hear back from you because you, you, you have such a great, like, composer mind i'm like oh man what's he gonna tell us to change this time but it, it really <laughs> happens it really happens so no what, what i'm excited for too adam which we haven't done yet because we've been working on so many of your your pieces is the collaboration that we have between like some of your like oral training sight reading skill examples too you know yeah so, like like could you explain how you would use like our recordings for just like your sight reading examples because yeah the gut instinct is like oh, it's a sight reading example. Why do I need a recording? You know? Yeah. And so like, so I believe heavily in oral training and sight singing. And so the oral training sheet, which is the most popular thing I have on my website is the oral training sheet. And that and the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Are yeah. In the Star Spangled Banner, I get lo lots of recordings. But the oral training sheet itself is incredibly popular because it's a very very simple concept of just 12 syllables in a line and you know they're randomized do re mi va so la ti do every syllable is in there and the goal is first to get students to be able to find it and there's a method behind it like if you can't find fa go back to do and sing the scale up to fa you can't yeah. find la go back to do and teaching them how to get back to do and practicing it and 
It's a wonderful tool. I love doing it in class. I do it with all of my students. They all master the sight singing, uh, the, the oral training sheet. But when they go home, there is no tool for them to know if they're on or not because the big issue students have are they lose dough. Yep. That's one issue. They lose dough. Or they sing a wrong pitch and they don't know that they've sung a wrong pitch. So they're singing la instead of sol or they're singing fa instead of me. And how do they know? Well, if there is an oral recording that will sing it at a slow pace or an opportunity and we, were, we have to talk about it, yeah. but maybe there's a way that we can create it at different speeds, mm -hmm. same line, so students could practice the oral training sheet with with the syllables along with the track. Because here's the thing, I want to address this because students that say to me, you know, all I'm doing is memorizing those 18 exercises. It's like, <laughs> I do it for four years and I'm just memorizing them. I'm like, yeah. So what you're telling me is you're memorizing do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti in every order, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Because if you're memorizing them in every order. Guess what? When you're sight singing, you're going to know where those pitches are. Right. Your, your brain knows them. So if <laughs> by you creating that there for them, the weaker singers and the average singers are going to have a tool that they can literally practice number one and go, do, mi, sol, mi, la, ti. But again, with beautiful tone. Mm -hmm. and with some clear direction at the same quality level that they would be getting a really high quality demo or rehearsal track. You know, I'm glad you mentioned with good tone because I think once you start to learn where those, those pitches are as a young singer, once that becomes muscle memory, then mm -hmm. you can work on, you know, a consistent tone throughout yes. the range, throughout your registers, you know, and, right. then, and then eventually that will become muscle memory. And right. then you can work on musicality when you're sight reading something. And then that right. becomes muscle memory. So eventually, if you work hard enough as a young singer, and if there are any young singers listening to this now, maybe even in college, like that can become muscle memory. You can get to the point where you sight read something with such a beautiful tone and musicality the very first time. That is possible. That's the goal. And, and just taking a step backwards, so I have four steps to developing oral training. And the first one is matching pitch. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is differentiating stepwise versus skipping. The oh, yeah. third is singing a scale and tune. And then the fourth is the oral training sheet. It's actually not in that exact order, but those four steps. Oh, and the point is I have rubrics for all four of these things because singing a scale is not an all or nothing skill. And I break that down. So, for example, there are students that never lose do when they sing a scale, but their me is flat and their yeah. t is flat. Yeah. And, and so that's, to me, on a scale of one to five is four out of five. Sure. Because they get all the but they sing a few. But then there's, um, did I lose you? You look a little frozen. I'll get the. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good. yeah. Okay, but then there's things like they go sharp a little bit throughout their scale and they end up on a different pitch. Right. And to a layman, it sounds like they're singing a scale perfectly in tune, but they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are all different ranges of things that happen. They sing do through, do through soul perfectly in tune, or they sing ascending perfectly in tune and descending out of tune. And so I have a rubric for this. So again, having a recording to practice with there are so many different little things that might be able to um be pinpointed at home that teachers will be able to assign to their singers that i would like to um build upon um because i think the rubrics themselves are unique and cutting edge because i don't think i don't know anybody else that has these rubrics but the oral component is missing and I'm excited to have, to, it's not going to be just asking you to record it. It's going to be discuss how would you approach this mm -hmm. to make it most effective? No, I, I think, I think, I think that's a perfect explanation on, on, on the question that I had asked. So before we wrap up, I know we didn't talk about this beforehand, but you're presenting at NAFME, I think yeah. or something. Could yes. you give the watchers or listeners like just sort of like, explain what you're presenting 
Yes, I'm so excited. This is this is the thing that is most near and dear to my heart. It's called the the erosion of the coral middle class, which is one of my very first blog posts out there mm -hmm. uh, that I wrote. And really, the whole premise is what happened to just people singing as part of our culture. What happened to the days when everybody had a piano? Yep. I mean, I don't know about you, but like my grandparents, that generation. And oh, on everybody had a piano. Everybody sang. Everybody sang at the holidays. Um, the grandparents they they just they just sang. Everybody and now we live in this culture that is you know the good people could sing and the bad people don't sing. It's about the best of the best versus nobody. Um, you know the singing. Leave it to the professionals. And then I talk about how we've caused this. In our education system, we as choral directors have created the loss of the choral middle class through our select ensembles. Mm -hmm. And I talk about not eliminating select ensembles. I think there's tremendous value to select ensembles, but it's about creating self-selected ensembles for everybody and making select ensembles additional not in place of for students and talking about how that even makes this the 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 top singers better by being part of a self-selected ensemble not just why it's better for the average and below average singers but why everybody benefits so i'm really excited about it and um if you're interested anybody's interested in it just look up on my website the erosion of the coral middle class and you can find an article on it and hopefully i'll be able to record this presentation I've, i did it um in north carolina at their uh, state festival a few months back as well okay yeah oh man that's that's awesome i think I think a lot of people will be interested in that. And I think a lot of people will learn from, from your, your presentation too, which I think is awesome. So, well, uh, yeah, let's, let's, I, I say we wrap up. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, if, if anyone wants to check out those oral training skill papers or, or, uh, or assessments or rubrics and blogs, like please visit Adam's website. It is just chocked full of teacher resources in there. Well, thanks. You know, like I said, I, I'm i still teaching. I plan to teach for a, a, a long time. I've been at the same school for 23 years. And I, I, you know, that's my primary thing. Choral clarity is my primary thing. My public school job um, and, and educating is, is my primary um, job. And this is all extra. This is what I'm doing for myself and me being reflective and trying to share my ideas and learn from others as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to partner with Kinison Coral Company. And I hope that everybody will go to your website and listen to the demo. Because for me, again, I said it before, pictures worth a thousand words. If you're wondering, well, I, I buy my coral tracks from another company or I've never really understood you know, what a demo can do because, you know, we're a choir and we have our own interpretation. Oh, I wanted to address that before we get off. Sure. Some of the comments that I hear people say why they don't do, don't use core rehearsal tracks is because they want to have their own interpretation and they feel like it's going to be ingrained the wrong interpretation, maybe a breath in the wrong spot or something that is not um, that, that they're going to get stuck. And I, I feel like it's really important that people understand my, at least my perspective that mu musicality is, it transcends from interpretation to interpretation. When students hear something sung well, they can adapt. It's like going from one conductor to another. When I bring in a guest conductor, I tell whatever the guest conductor is, I don't want you to ask me any questions about what I interpret. I want you to go up there and do whatever you want to do. And guess what happens? My students, they respond immediately to that conductor because that conductor is doing what they want to do. So I feel like a core rehearsal track, the key is that students are experiencing what high level singing is and learning the part and they will be able to adapt to another approach. Yes, yes, it's totally a foundational yeah. tool. It's yes. not an artistic tool. Ever will it be an artistic yeah. tool. It's always a foundational tool to learn the notes, rhythms, 
and, and uh, words and to rehearse them over and over and over so that the director does have that chance to change whatever they want to change and to hold whatever they want to hold, to move whatever they want to move. Right. And so with that, I do hope everybody listens to the demo because I think if you just go on there, listen to your demo and then say, hey, you know what? Let me click on a piece that I've always wanted to do or that I've done with my choir and let me listen to all the parts. Yeah. You can get everything you need to know from that. If you listen and, and you hear a recording, you'll know why I believe in your product and why I think it's the, the best recording on the market. Because to me, it's, it's clear. Now, it's some, people have all different opinions, and that's great. But if you listen and you, and you feel that way, I hope that, that you'll use Kinnison and Coral Company, uh, you know, moving, moving along, you know, moving forward. And that's why I'm, you know, and also not to mention how easy you are to work with and how likable you and Carrie are. Um, to me, there's a lot of value in the personalized attention. And again, that's not to say that I don't feel that way about other companies. Sure. It's more that I do feel that way about, about both of you. And, and I hope that when people see me and Coral Clarity, that they see a face also and that they know that I'm a real person who is out there um, you know, with my baby crying right. and, and right. it's like, it's like I, you know, I, I told you this before we recorded, it's like, we're all just normal people. It's not like we're celebrities. Yeah. It's not like we're living in LA or well, you're in New York, so. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we're just normal people. And like Carrie and I are former teachers ourselves. So like, we know what it's like to be in the shoes of an educator. You know, we still consider ourselves educators. So yeah, we're just, we're just normal people. Just come up and talk to us. <laughs> Exactly. So thank you so much. I'm so glad we could have this conversation. And I really hope that, that, you know, my, my uh, followers and subscribers and the people that are purchasing from you, considering it, will come back to us with questions yeah. and, and reach out and ask us because we want to help. Our primary goal is to help. Yes, we'd love for you to buy our products and, and read our blogs, but it, you know, the, the most important thing is that we can be helping and shaping the next generation of music teachers and students out there with what we do. So thank you all. And uh, thanks so much. Charlie. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Adam.